Okay, uh, so this is the lecture for uh, micro two and uh, the week before uh, spring break. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about, uh, I actually have another set of slides here, but I haven't mixed them up properly. Maybe I'll do that real quick. So, all right, so, so we'll talk about this real quick and then we'll switch. So I want to cover calibrating the touch panel and I want to talk a little bit about the PID controller and hopefully we'll get both of those things done. Uh, so for those of you doing the touch panel, uh, we, uh, I still have to get the software uh, ported over or written from scratch on uh, MCU Expresso because we're not using uh, the code wire. Uh, and hopefully I'll get all that done on spring break. It's, it's, it's actually, uh, uh, I'm bitten off a little more than I can chew in the time I have. But we'll, we'll definitely work on that. And I think, I think I can get something up and running. I guess absolute worst case, we'll go back to and we'll install CodeWire and we'll run uh, CodeWire 10.5. Um, I think I have enough installation files for that that we can make that work. We'll see. In any event, uh, I'd like to use MCU Expresso. It's much nicer, but it, it's, it, there, it has some additional features that are really nice, but uh, they're making porting the code over a little difficult. <clears throat> okay, so... So, so let me. I'm going to switch slides to these others because they're actually better. Okay, so so the calibration problem. It looks like this. You draw a red circle on a touch panel, but what you actually get is the blue circle. And notice how the blue circle's distorted because it's not a circle anymore. It's an ellipse. It's slightly rotated, and its center is not in the center. So it's translated. So it's scaled, rotated, and translated. Uh, and this is what we want to correct. So the way we're going to do that uh, is we're going to use, uh, we're, going to, we're going to actually take some data from the touch panel itself, once it's all installed and running the way it's supposed to be. And then we're going to take the raw coordinates and we're going to uh, we're going to uh, conduct a set of equations to map them to the desired coordinates. Now, the desired coordinates are just arbitrary, right? Uh, so, so, so first let's see how you can correct this arbitrary problem and then we'll apply it to our tilt table. So how do you correct this with a transform? And how do you calculate the transformation? How does that work? Uh, so just guessing, we might want to suggest that our new x-coordinate would be some function of their old coordinate plus perhaps a constant. And, uh, and of course, same, and we would have uh, this function, one would be for the x-coordinate with a constant one, and then we'd have a function two for the y-coordinate with a constant two. In both cases, we have to put in the old x and y values. So to calculate the new x, we need the old x and the old y. To calculate the new y, we need the old x and the old y again. All right. Now, uh, let's see, I think I did that. Yeah, so the function of the old x and y can become, can look like this. You can, you can break this function down into essentially two constants because it's a linear transformation. Now if, it's, now, if there are non-linearities in it, then we're going to have a problem with that, and we're just going to assume that it's a linear function. Uh, it is possible that there could be some non-linearity uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in our actual touch panel, uh, and that would, have, that would require uh, a, home, uh, you know, a second order solution. All right, so now our, our new x is some constant times our old x, plus some constant times our old y, plus a constant. And our new y is the same thing, which gives us a, b, and c for the x equation, and d, e, and f for this. And what we need to do is figure out this a, b, c, and d, e, f. The c and f can be kind of factored out separately. 
and these are just going to only affect translation. So, and we can actually adjust these once we get all the once we calculate all this, we can modify the CNF to uh, to to move the center around if we want to do that. Um, okay, and you can see that's because CNF don't have any relation to the old X and Y. They're just uh, they're just uh, they're they're just a, a constant added to the new values. Could be plus or minus. All right, so what we want to do, we want to do an arbitrary transformation. We take, we take our, our original, and this, in this case, we have, um, we, sh we take the shape A, and we want to show how to transform it to shape B. Now, in this case, we're doing it completely arbitrary, but obviously in our case, what we want to do is, is, is we want to, we, we want to do something more like here, where we want to morph the blue into something more like the red circle. Okay. All right. But in this case, we're just going to do an arbitrary transform of the shape A into shape B. And obviously, shape B is bigger, so we're going to have to scale it. Obviously, shape B has a longer uh, X component here. Uh, and so, and obviously, there's a slight rotational difference. Notice the red point here corresponds to that red point and the blue point to that blue point. Now, to do this, uh, we can we can we can go through uh, the the we can go through the geometry of this uh, fairly uh, straightforwardly, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because because in the end we're going to boil this down to the simple transform, and we're going to use linear algebra to do it. Uh, but I do want you to understand what's going on. Okay, so so the first step is translation, and so what we what we do, we're just going to look at one point for now. We'll look at x1, y1, okay, this point. And what we want to do, the move to the center is just the translation shown by uh, x1, uh, b, where, uh, where the, the original value here is x1a, y1a. And the new value is going to be x1b, y1b. So to get x1a to move to this point where we've centered our shape is just a simple constant and we'll call this tx for the x and ty for the y. This is going to correspond to our c and our f. Okay, so no problem with this. Now, now we're going to fix the rotation. And the first thing we'll do is we'll we'll we'll, we'll rotate it so it's so it's uh, perpendicular to our axes and then we'll add the corrective rotation to make it rotated by the amount of our target. Okay, so this rotation by theta gives us this equation here. Obviously, x times the cosine and y minus y times the sine. And here, we for the y, we have x times the sine plus y times the cosine. And, and these are just uh, straightforward uh, uh, trigonometry. And you probably have forgotten this transform, and so have I. But anyway, there it is. Okay, and we get the new y1c. So we've we've gone from a using the we from a we created x x1b and x, and y1b, and now we created x1c y1c. Now it's not in terms of our original x1a and y1a, so we have to add the translational constants. And now we can, with the addition of the translational constants now, we have it back in terms of our original raw values, the x1a and the y1a. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So we only translated the, the red point, but obviously the same equation would work for the blue point. Okay. And... Uh, the other thing that's a little bit tricky, you have to remember that this constant now, it was not our original translational constant, but it's also, uh, it's, it, it's been moved from where the, 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 the x1b and y1b got moved by just the, the, the simple constant to this new position. So, so we have to add, we have to add, uh, we have to make this new k has to be uh, the original translation times cosine theta uh, minus 
the y translation times sine theta, uh, same same transform for their for our uh, simple translational constants. Okay, so we have to transform those two, and now we have this new expression. Okay, now we want to scale it. Okay, so we want to scale uh, our scaling factors are gx and gy to give it the same shape uh, and the same size as our uh, as the the, the rectangle we're trying to go for, which was rectangle B. And uh, so we take our same equation here, take this equation, and we're going to scale it by GX and by GY for Y. So the X axis will be scaled by GX, the Y value will be scaled by GY. And we just we multiply all three of our uh, factors by the GX, all three by the GY for the Y. Now, uh, now we want to match the rotation of B, so we're going to go through the same uh, rotational transformation. So we know that to get to match the rotation of B, we have to rotate by uh, the angle alpha. And so we get the same, the same transform. And now we get 1E, but it's in terms of 1D. So now we have to do the entire process to get back to 1A and x1a and y1a and so so we add we add in uh, we add in uh, this is our new expression so our final coordinate the red coordinate is x1e and it's given by x1 alpha uh, x1a times a capital a plus y1a times capital b plus p where a is given by this B is given by that, P is given by this, D is given by this, and so forth. All right, so that's that's the actual geometry of this transformation using all the trigonometry. All right, now, all we have to do then uh, is change uh, the constant terms C and F. Where uh, C because we didn't really have C, we have A, B, A, B, D, and E, but we didn't have C, C and, and uh, F. So this P uh, equals this, uh, but to get that back to our final C, we have to, we have to, uh, P is this P plus TX and F is Q plus TY. All right, now, how do we do the actual transformation? Well, first we let's start with the three-point example. So, so remember we have we have one, two, three, four, five, six unknowns. So to, to solve for six unknowns, we're going to have to have six equations, and uh, so that's why we need three points, uh, each with an x y coordinate value, and then we can set these up, and that'll give us our six equations. We can do this with linear algebra. And then we can expand this to a multi-point transformation, which uh, with you need a minimum of three points. If you have more points than you need, then you can do, then you're essentially doing a least squares fit. And fortunately, linear algebra automatically handles the least square fitting uh, as part of the linear algebra, which is truly amazing. Okay, so we start with uh, a pair of equations. The final, this is the final pair. This is what we're going for. The transformation from our initial uh, coordinate, our raw value, to our to our scaled, translated, and rotated value. In this case, from 1a to 1f. Okay, both for x and y. Notice how the x equation has to have it, the x and the y, and the y equation has to have the x 1a and the y 1a as well, plus our constants c and f, which are the translational constants. So knowing that we have six unknowns, we're going to need six equations to solve for these unknowns. And you can do that with three XY data points. So you, you fire up your equipment, and uh, let me just show you that sort of if we can. Um, let's see, I believe I have, maybe let me shrink this down for a minute. And this too. Okay, so if we look at our, if we look at our tilt table, what I want you to see here, maybe I'll maybe I'll expand this as much as I can and then print this over it. Maybe we'll see. Yeah, I'll do that. 
Okay, let's do this. And then we'll put this over here and maybe we can make it go down some. Okay, so so our, our software is running and it's reading the touch panel continuously and it's printing out the value that it reads. So so all I really have to do is just hit the reset button and that's gonna stop the printing and it's gonna let me pick a point. So I'm just gonna go ahead and arbitrarily, I'm gonna pick the center. And and I, I what I could do, and probably the easiest thing to do is just to put this steel ball right on that spot as best I can. And I'm just gonna try and hold it there as stable as I can. And then once I see it, it's kinda of looking pretty cool, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna stop it. Now I'll go up here and I'll look. I could take a bunch of rows and average them. That'd probably be just fine. I don't know if you can see this, the numbers are pretty small. But my x value is very consistently reading uh, 0 0.011 or maybe 0 0.010 or maybe even 0 0.009. So that would average out pretty nicely to, to 0 0.010. So that's my x. So my x, so I'll write that value down. Uh, and I have a little, I have a little uh, thing here to do this. And so, so I would, uh, this was the center, and my x was uh, 0 0.010, and then my y uh, is, looks like it's between minus 0.999 and minus 1. All right, so it looks like, I have to say it's pretty close. So I'm going to, it's like 9985. 9999. So I think I'm going to go with 9999. So it's going to be minus point, uh, 0 0.999. All right. So those are the raw values for center. And then I'll start it running again. To do that, I have to bring up uh, Code Warrior and punch the green arrow. And then I'll shrink that back down. The numbers are running again. And now I'm going to take the ball and I'll put it over here maybe on the corner where everything should be plus one, minus one. And I'll like, leave the ball right there. And then I get as close to that dot as I can. And I'll stop it again. And then I'll uh, put this out of the way. And I'll move this out. So I was using that point right here. And I, now I'm reading, and I guess I, yeah, anyway, I, I probably have the sign screwed up here, but anyway, so uh, I'm reading pretty consistently, um, pretty consistently uh, minus 657, minus 658, minus 659. So I'm going to say minus 658. So, so that's going to be, that's, and we're going to call that the, uh, the, yeah, I, I, I call the, the back edge, we call that the back right. So that, so that x value is going to be minus 0 0.658, 0 0.658. And then the y is, um, yeah, maybe my y is not reading correctly. Let's, let's just... Uh, looks like it's minus point nine nine nine. Hmm. A little bit worried now. Maybe my maybe my uh, yeah. Let's we may have to do this again. I, my wires may have gotten loose here. Let's try this again. Uh, we'll start it again. I think my y value is bogus. Uh, yeah, now it's reading more of what it should. So let's, so let me, I'm going to go back and do this thing all again. Okay. So, yeah, so now my center X, okay, so this is, this is better. I, I don't know. So it's point zero zero. I think point zero zero. So point, uh, 0 0.008 is good, and the y is 0 0.032. So 
So 0 0.032. Okay, so that's better. Yeah, I, my wire was loose. Okay, now let's do it again. Uh, we'll start the... Uh, see, I lost my... I um, hope I didn't kill that thing. No, it's there. Okay, good. So where... Oh, I guess it's there. Okay. Okay. So, and now I guess we just do this. All right. And then I gotta pull up code wire. Okay. And we'll let it run again, and I'll go back up here to this corner. And then I'll. Okay, and we'll get rid of this. Okay, so this is better. So minus 0 0.421, maybe 0 0.420. Okay. So minus, yeah, you can see that was really off. Minus 0 0.420, and then and then uh, and then the x is gonna the y is gonna be minus seven. We'll say 781. Minus 0 0.781. Minus 0 0.781. Okay, now I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but you get the idea. Uh, I I can keep doing points and, and measuring, but let's take a few more just just uh, just so you can see. Let's go ahead and uh, we'll get it running again, and then maybe we'll do the other corner down here. And then now we have an x of. So this is the this is the uh, front left. So our x value is. Uh, it looks like it's looks like it's plus. Um, point four. It looks like point four five. Point four five one. So we'll go uh, zero. Uh, point uh, four five one, and then and then uh, over here we have uh, plus point seven point seven uh, point seven six zero oh, plus uh, zero point seven six zero. Oh. Okay, so you can see. Uh, these these values are a little bit you know they're a little bit screwed up and that's why we that's why it's necessary to do these cal do these calibrations um, and once we populate this then we have all our raw values our raw x and our raw y and then we would complement these with okay for our center our our desired calibrated value is going to be zero is going to be z zero zero and uh, we don't want that. And then our our um, so our back right. So this corner right here, that's going to be we we just arbitrarily called that uh, plus one plus one. So we would say one one. And this one is minus one minus one all right now uh, you could def you can define those however you want it's however you're gonna however you're going to interpret your the ball's position so when 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 you get a calibrated value uh, if you use this if it's one one you know the ball is in this corner if it's minus one minus one you know it's there zero zero it's in the center uh, minus one 
one, it's over here, and uh, uh, plus one, minus one, you know, it's over in uh, the corner over here. And so you, so it's somewhat arbitrary how you pick that, but you you can do it however you want. Okay, now, uh, so let's continue. So uh, let's see. I wanna. Okay. All right. So now you can see. Uh, so. So basically, here's how this works. So we have three points, uh, x1, x2, x1, y1, x2, y2, and x3, y3. Now these are, the raw points are going to be the, uh, yeah, so the, so this, so the, the so we have, we've scaled these, these points we've determined uh, based on how we want to map this. So in our case, you know, the center would be zero, zero, and uh, up here would be plus one, plus one, down here would be minus one, minus one. And so we'd, we may, we'd get a little, uh, you know, a little a gradiated uh, sheet here, and we'd figure out where these points were. Uh, and, we'd, and these would be the, the scaled, you know, the translated rotated scaled values. So that's what the that's what this represents. Our 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 x1 x2 y2 desired values, our x y1 y2 y3 desired values, and then the raw values, the actual data we read from x1 y1 would be x1 y1, and from x2 y2 would be x2 y2, and from x3 y3 would x3 y3. Notice, of course, for both the x and the y values, you have to have both the x and the y values in their equation. And then we have our C and our F, our translational, uh, 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 translational um, um, values, constants. Okay, so, so we now we have these three pairs, and um, this is what we're going to actually read. So, there, so that's, so that's uh, in here. This represents, so we would call this x, uh, th this would be, you know, x1, uh, x2, x3, this would be y1, y2, y3. And this is uh, x1d, y1d, x1, x2d, y2d, and x3d, y3d. So, so those are the, those are our desired values. Now, obviously, Plus one, plus one, zero, zero, and minus one, minus one would be wrong for this uh, particular problem. And in truth, uh, you generally would not want them lined up in a line because I think that can cause problems with the linear algebra. So you'd probably want them scattered like this. All right. So, so hopefully, hopefully, and, and the reason why this is important is if you build a device with a touch screen, then you're going to have to map your touch panel information to your uh, to your display information so that it lines up. And a lot of times uh, on the old iPhones, you had, you had to do that manually. When you power up your phone, you had to touch it in three places, and then the phone would calculate the transform, and, and then from then on out, you'd be touching where you thought you would. Some of the later phones don't seem to need to do that, and I, I guess they, they've... Uh, they, I'm not sure how they even just... Maybe they've just got much better touch panels or maybe they uh, do factory calibrations and then store that information in the phone someplace so you never have to do it again. Uh, of course, if you drop it a couple times, maybe it'll move and you might have to. But in any event, um, yeah, you don't seem to have to do that anymore. All right, so let's look at the matrix math. So basically, this is how this equation looks. Uh, we, have, uh, we have our um, the desired values, our scaled values, and then we have our, our actual measured values. Now this measured value matrix Z looks like this. Notice we have this row of constants here. And we have to put those constants in in order to, uh, to calculate our, our linear transform. So it's a little confusing about this, but, but basically you've got an X and a Y and a translation constant here. And, it's, and we just put in one. All right. So that's, that's 
that's just uh, throwing a sop to the requirements of our linear algebra. All right, so notice we have this equals this matrix multiplied by our ABC, so that's for the X values. And for the Y values, we have this matrix multiplied by DEF. All right, and so if we now we have to rewrite this because what we want to solve for is our ABC. Because these we know these values because that's the, those are the values we have determined we're going to call the various positions. In our case, again, those are the 1, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, minus 1 points. And the raw values are in this matrix. Okay, so what do we do? We invert Z and we multiply. And that gives us ABC equals Z inverse times... Uh, uh, times uh, our desired values, and then that's going to let us calculate these constants. Three of them for x, three of them for y. Okay, but one of the problems is, uh, and remember this one's there because of the constant term. One of the problems is we have to assume that z is invertible, and there may be, if you choose them poorly, they, they may not be. So you do have to be careful about that, and I think that's one of the issues with a straight line. It could be a problem. All right. Um, so, so that's our three-point calibration. Now, what's really powerful about linear algebra is we can we can overdetermine this problem. We need at least three, you know, we need at least three well six equations. So we need at least a three by three matrix to do this. But uh, but you can overdetermine that. You can have more many more than three, and if you do this. You, you, you do this with a couple of linear algebra tricks, you find that the linear algebra does at least squares fit for you. And it's pretty spectacular. So, so let's, say we, let's say we do nine equations. We're going to do an endpoint uh, calibration. In our case, we, we're going to, you know, when we actually do it for real, I'm going to have you do the nine points. And, and again, uh, you know, the nine points, we'll, we'll have you do them. Now you can't even really see it, but... Um, but you, you saw the, the points that we had on there. Uh, we can put those back on. I think I can do that with this. Yeah, so we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's our 9-point calibration, and that's that's what we want to do. Um, that's what we want to do. Uh, and we could do more. It would probably be even more accurate if we do more. Um, all right, so here's our, here's our, uh, our, our equations. Um, so x1, 2, 3 to xn, and y1, 2, 3 to yn. In our case, we'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and y1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 for our desired values. And they would be things like 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, 0, minus 1, uh, 1. All right. So... So we can just, we have more equations than unknown, so we can do a least squares fit. And the way this works, we one of the things we have to do is we have to make sure that Z is invertible. Well, it turns out if you multiply a matrix by its transform, it's always invertible. And and yet it still, it still works. Uh, so we multiply Z by its transform, and then we invert it. And then we multiply that inverted matrix by its transform. And that, that gives us, uh, then we multiply that by uh, our desired, our, our predetermined values, our, our, our desired outcomes. And that allows us to get a least squares fit number for A, B, and C, which works for our F, uh, for our X value. And we do the same thing for D, E, F, and we get that, we get that for our Z value. And, uh, Although this looks like a lot of math, the really good news is we have MATLAB. And uh, this probably is a little bit hard to see. Uh, let's see, let me go back to here. So in this case, I, I did a bunch of different things, but basically uh, we create one of these matrices with, uh, with nine data points. Uh, in this case, it was like minus 0 0.88 uh, for the X, 0.843 for the Y, and one for our constant. And then the next value, the next value. We had nine of these values, and that that generates then a matrix. Uh, 
And then we do this equation where I did several different data collections. I just created new matrices, so don't let that confuse you. And then we have to put our desired values in. And I, I didn't, uh, I did different things playing around with it. But in the end, I wanted to do minus one. Uh, and this one, I only did five values, uh, or four values rather, the four corners. Uh, but anyway, uh, we put in the raw values. In our case, the raw values would be, uh, for x would be one, 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 zero, 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 and minus one, minus one, minus one. So, uh, yeah, I miswrote one of these. Yeah, this is, no, that's a minus, and that's a minus. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's minus one. I think I'll flip this around. Oh, yeah, I did. I'm reading the back side of it. No wonder it doesn't look right. All right. Well, anyway. Um, okay, so so we put in that matrix, and then we, we just do this little equation right here. The that that gives us our uh, that gives us our uh, that that basically inverts this product, multiplies it by that times the x, and uh, and so. That F looks like, if we go down here, the F gives us three values, our, our, and we use it for this data, but it wouldn't be, these are the wrong numbers for what we're gonna do. Um, and anyway, we, uh, we get our three constants. We get the ones for, to calculate our, our, our desired X value and for, to calculate our desired Y value from any raw X, Y pair that we read. Uh, so that's pretty cool, and we just have to use the equation that we uh, that we just looked at, uh, which I believe, yeah. So this equation right here, once we get this, then that allows us to, and this basically does at least squares fit. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Okay, so let's see, and the least squares, so the equations we're actually using are, uh, it's this right here. We take our raw value for x, our raw value for y, and we, multi our, and we multiply by a and b, and, and add, you know, add them together, plus c, to give us our, our transposed, our scaled, rotated, and, and transposed value, and our translated value and do the same for y using the different constants def and that's all there is to it okay so hopefully that makes uh, some good sense let's now um, I think we'll shift gears and we'll talk about the uh, we'll talk about the uh, the uh, PID controller okay and, and just to finish up uh, um, so here's our equation our corrected values for x and y, and we have our we have our three functions uh, a, b, c. We called them before, uh, and uh, and d, e, f. But now they're what you can also call it f one, f two, f three, g one, g two, g three. However you want to label them is fine. And this is what this looks like, and it's a pretty simple transformation. We can actually go ahead and plot. Uh, we can then go ahead and take the raw values that we measure, and do the correction after the least squares fit, and then plot them along with the actual uh, desired values, uh, and we can see how closely they line up. And, and we can see that, uh, that our corrected values in the green are better than our uh, measured values in the blue. Okay, uh, there's, here the correction is a little worse, but generally, uh, generally they're much better. And you can see in every other case, is they're, they're much better. Not perfect. Um, and that's also, you know, there's, there's some imperfection in everything. That's why your touch screen doesn't work perfectly. Uh, and you, some places on it, you, you have trouble hitting the right thing. Um, all right. Let's talk about PID controller. So uh, I know some of you have taken controls, and so you're, you're, you should be all over this. Uh, for those of you who haven't, uh, hopefully this will be a useful little uh, introduction. 
there's a lot to be said about PID controllers. I mean, people, you know, there, you can take an entire course on just that. And, uh, and a good portion of the world runs on PID control. Uh, so it's very important. Uh, it's not the whole world of, uh, there's also nonlinear control and there's a whole bunch of other things. Um, but, um, but most of the world runs pretty well when it needs to be controlled uh, on a PID controller. The PID stands for a proportional integral and derivative. And, and this is something every engineer should know, even if you're not going to do controls. Uh, you have an output function, u, and you have uh, an error term, e, that is that, that uh, it's, it's based on time. Now, you have three terms, and each of these terms has a constant. Now, this is not the only way to do this, uh, but this is one of what I think is the better ways, but it's not the only way. Uh, sometimes sometimes the, what, some of the constants are grouped in different ways here, but here each constant is separated out. So the proportional constant is kp, the integral constant here is ki, and the derivative constant is kd. Now, notice here, we have we have uh, the proportional constant is just simply measured and multiplied by the error term and added. And the uh, and and again and th and this is going to be the 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 correction right. This is going to be the output of our controller. The integral term we sum up over a period of time, and we integrate the we integrate the. The, 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 the error term uh, as it's summed up over time. So it's the error term uh, summed up from zero to t and, uh, and then we have for the derivative term we take the derivative of the error term. So, so those are, and we do this, we do this uh, discreetly because we don't, we don't have a continuous function, or generally we don't. So we do these discreetly. And uh, so what we do, we, we measure the error term at time one and time two, time three, time four. And, uh, and then we take the delta between time uh, one and two, and that's going to be the derivative. And we take, then we sum up time one, time two, time three. Uh, we sum up uh, that, that delta, that dt, uh, for that period of time, we sum up all those all those all those small changes, and uh, and then that gives us our derivative term. So we integrate them essentially, and uh, and we do this in two dimensions because our in, our controller is uh, each each axis has its own controller effectively, and um, because our our uh, uh, because well that's it's a two-dimensional problem and so we need to have a two-dimensional solution so we do it with uh, it, we resolve it to two uh, different uh, orthogonal axes and then we we calculate the, uh, the the control inputs for each axis in this particular case we have a servo on each axis so it, that makes that part fairly straightforward uh, we could do it with three servos and we can have and then we would have to map from our our two axis controls uh, to a, a three axis actuator and that would just be again a linear mapping um, all right in that case though we would not just have uh, well this whole thing is complicated a little bit by the fact that uh, that although the center of the tilt table will always be at the same point or pretty close to the same point uh, the ends of the tilt table are actually moving uh, you're, you're tilting the whole plane so they're not not just moving uh, they're moving the axis in, in a in a Z direction and that's how it of course it exerts its effect um, all right so we have what's called a set point which is where we want the uh, the system output to be and uh, and that for our purposes we're going to define that as the center of the tilt table or zero zero and then we measure where the ball actually is, and we get an error. We get an X error and a Y error. 
and all that error is just the set point minus our measured value. So we, we like it to be at zero, zero, but it's not. It's some place off, and that's going to give us an error. Now, the error could be positive or negative, and we do have to be careful to get our signs all correct, uh, because if we don't, uh, our control function will typically blow up. And then we generate our output, which in this case drives the servo. And, and in this case, we've resolved it to two different axes, so we have two different servos. This is the, this is the classic control diagram, if you will. And here's where the PID controller code lives. Uh, you have a set point, which in this case uh, is zero, so you actually don't need this input. Uh, and what you want is the, uh, the, uh, the actual position comes out here, and uh, that's compared to where it's supposed to be. In this case, it's supposed to be at zero, so then you generates an error. The error goes into your PID controller. The controller generates a output to the servo. The servo changes uh, the position of the tilt table and the ball moves. And now we have a new ball position that we actually read. And that that's we read that through the touch panel. And that actually is now our measured position. And that, that then uh, compares to our set point, which is, of course, zero in this case. Uh, and then we generate another another error, and that error then goes into our PD, PID controller, and we send a new setting out to the servo, which then we now read a new ball position, and uh, and we read that from the touch panel, which then outputs the measured position, which becomes the new error, and this goes round and round. There are uh, because there are certain lags in this. Uh, there's not much of a lag in our tilt table. It's pretty good, but there's there are millisecond lags, uh, and so that that uh, that means well that causes some problems because the ball can be moving fairly quickly. So there can be situations where our servo, where our controller will not be able to uh, do what it has to do, and that's because uh, our servo has limited control authority. Uh, we don't have an infinite uh, uh, capability to affect the ball. We can only affect it within certain reason. So if you throw the ball on fairly quickly, it's going to roll off the table no matter what the controller does because it's limited by the actual uh, mechanical uh, speed and the, and the amount of tilt that we can, the maximum amount of tilt we can generate. And of course, then we're just dependent on gravity. So uh, so there, there are limits and there, there certainly are points of non-linearity, but we assume linearity in this system. So this is, a, and a PID controller is, is a linear control. All right. So again, the proportional part of the control is very straightforward. You, you, here's your set point. You want to balance the ball at zero. The ball is here, so you've got an error. So what do you do to get the ball here? You put in a correction. And then that correction then looks like this. And that's your, that's your, that's your, your uh, proportional constant times your error term. And that then, gen and you, of course, you have to, you have to be clever and make sure all your signs are working correctly, uh, so that your correction actually corrects as opposed to makes worse. Now the ball starts moving, and of course, as the ball moves, the uh, the 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 difference between the position of the ball and the desired position, the air term, gets smaller. So here it's big. So we get a big effect because it's just multiplied by the error term. Here it's smaller, so we get a smaller effect. And here it's zero. But there's a small problem. And the problem is when the ball gets here, it's got a velocity. So it's not going to stay here. And it's going to continue. And uh, now it's, we're going to have an error term with the opposite sign. And we're going to have a correction that's the opposite correction. Now in this case, uh, we're going to do the, all of the controlling from one end, but we have the ability to move it above or below the level plane. And, and hopefully we're able to put in, and then as the ball continues, now we have a big error, so we have a bigger correction, and fortunately the ball stops. So you can see that um, that if you just have a proportional controller, 
you can well imagine that you're going to have uh, you're going to have a lot of overshoot and you're going to have a lot of oscillation about your target and that's exactly what happens and uh, if you make your 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 constant too big then your correction will be so great that uh, that you'll probably lose uh, you'll probably uh, you'll probably oscillate the thing off the table so you have to be you have to be careful uh, okay now what if, what can we do to help make this a little better we can add in a derivative control and when we add in the derivative what happens is there's an error term and we put in the proportional correction and now the ball starts moving with some velocity v then that velocity v obviously moves it a certain distance and that gives us a delta error in our error term because we went from a big error term to a smaller error term so now we have a delta error and we use that delta error then to uh, to adjust our proportional constant so that uh, we actually uh, start to slow the ball down as it gets to the center and then and then hopefully it arrives at the center where the air term is zero with zero velocity now uh, the key here is to to and we call it tuning to tune our controller constants so that we get uh, we get a good rapid correction but very little overshoot and good dampening so that there's not much oscillation back and forth and it turns out perfection's tough to achieve there's always going to be either a little oscillation or a little overshoot or um, it's going to take longer our, 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 our ability to capture a ball rolled on fairly quickly is going to be less so uh, there's always a lot of trade-offs depending on what your controller is actually controlling. In some cases, you, you can't live with overshoot. So you, you have to make sure there's no overshoot. An example of that would be um, where you're uh, guiding a car you know, down a highway and you have to stay in the lane. You'd much rather oscillate a little more in the lane than you would uh, leave the lane when there's a car next to you and, run, and bang into that car. So, uh, so there you're you're going to err on the side of, of minimizing overshoot. In other cases, a little overshoot is fine, which might give you the ability to make more rapid corrections. And uh, just like with temperature, a little bit of temperature overshoot in many cases, it's no big deal. Uh, and but it helps you to get uh, a uh, it helps you to get the uh, the the incubator or the oven or whatever uh, up to the proper temperature much quicker. So. So you, there's always trade-offs as you tune these constants. All right, now uh, in the integral term, uh, I actually used to think that uh, there was not a great need for it on the tilt table, but it turns out um, there is. And, I'll, I'll, and that is the, the tilt table does, can suffer from uh, what's called a steady state error. Now, uh, I'll demonstrate, I think I have demonstrated this before, uh, but I will def definitely demonstrate it so that you can see. But what a steady state error for the tilt table is, if you take the whole tilt table, and let's say the tilt table is not quite level, so, 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 so the system knows where the ball is supposed to be, but because the table is off level, the system can actually never get the the ball to the center now at first at first brush that seems that just doesn't make intuitive sense so you you do have to think about this a little bit but trust me uh, even though the even though the controller knows that the ball is not in the right place the steady state error creates a problem because the ball rolls off and and the controller puts in uh, the corrective action, but the corrective action is insufficient to get the ball to the center. And, and the controller already knows that, that it's putting in the calculated correct action, 
and, and it simply doesn't work and the ball actually may get stuck over here and, and it'll hover around the point off center because of the because you've got the tilt table uh, you know sort of off level. So, so it's very interesting and that's where the integral term comes in. The integral term we usually keep that fairly small but what it does over time as the ball sits over here there's a there's a constant error and and although that constant error has has been used by the proportional term to put in a constant correction all that constant correction does is stabilize the ball off center it doesn't return at the center because uh, it's insufficient to do that because the tables not level and uh, but the integral term sees that that persisting error and it begins to add an integrated amount of correction over time as it continues to add that error the error the the integral contribution fr from that integrated error becomes greater and greater and eventually starts to move the ball back to the center well as it does that the integral term starts to go down a little bit and then and and what basically happens then is everything just sort of works out that with the present with the integral term it will eventually get the ball back to the center uh, and it's really it's really neat to watch this uh, because what you can do is you can take out your integral term um, so so basically all we really have to do uh, to enter, to implement these controllers uh, there's probably a better video uh, to, to watch than to go through this right here um, but basically we we you know, we, we wind up with a control loop. So outside the controller loop, we initialize all our functions, we set our controller gains, we set our control gain factors and whatever. And then inside the loop, we get the coordinates from the touch panel. We transform the raw values to the to our to our uh, transform to our transformed values. And then we we take this 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 now becomes uh, we our error because we now take the actual value uh, from the desired value and that gives us an error and then we put that error into our PID controller which gives us an updated servo output and basically it looks like this so we we just there our error and then uh, we we have to uh, one of the things we have we want to do when we have a PID controller, it's really important. It, it, at least it's a it's a generally a really good idea to execute your inside loop at very regular intervals so that your delta error is always the same. Because if your delta, if your delta time rather not delta error, but your delta time is always the same. If your delta time jumps around, then it screws everything up, uh, and it's much better if you can have very consistent. Uh, that you up, do these updates at very consistent time intervals. Okay, uh, and then uh, so even though you shoot for this consistent update, you can have these little variations, so it's always good to get an accurate delta time. Um, okay, normally the way you tune these things is you start with a small amount of proportional and, uh, and no derivative and no integral, and then you keep increasing your proportional until you get some measure of control, but usually with a fair amount of overshoot and oscillation. So then you start adding in some derivative gain and you should begin to dampen the oscillation. As that happens, you can usually up your proportional gain a little bit to get a little more responsive controller. And to, when you do that, then you get a little more oscillation, so you add a little more uh, derivative gain. Uh, until you get kind of your desired behavior. So sometimes a tiny increase in your proportional may require a bigger increase in your differential. And uh, typically, if you get either one of these constants uh, very much out of the sweet spot, you'll have a fairly unstable, uh, unstable situation. Uh, and you will off, you typically oscillate to where the ball falls off the table. And if you don't have, if you've got too little of one of them or both, then you, you'll often uh, just have, uh, you, it won't be able to, 
to capture the ball at all. The ball will just roll off every time. So, so you have to play with it. And of course, you may have uh, enough uh, delays in your system and some and some nonlinearity in your servos and and just some noise in your system that may make it very difficult for you to achieve control. So this is a very nice little model uh, because if you can get this, if you can balance the ball on there, you have a pretty reasonably tuned PID controller uh, with a pretty accurate, uh, pretty responsive uh, system. So it's actually a very, uh, it's a very nice little, little thing. You, you know very well just doing this as a human being on a flat platter with a big steel ball is not entirely trivial. You have to pay pretty close attention and practice a few times before you can really get that ball to stay on that platter and not roll all over the place. And, um, and you will see, you, I think you'll be quite proud of yourself when you get your PID controller tuned and you balance the ball. I think you'll find that to be a, a moment of uh, uh, nerd nirvana. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Okay, I think that's about all I wanted to talk about. Uh, so I have a lot of, uh, I'll, I'll try and do a, a short video and talk about the lab. Uh, I'm, the lab for tomorrow, the lab for this week may be, uh, uh, may not be too impressive, but we'll, we'll, do, one of the, we'll do one of the demo labs and uh, we'll talk about it a little bit. All right, with that, I'm going to stop.